Um, so we're joined by um, our Strauss & Co's wine specialists, um, uh, Roland Peens and Higo Jacobs. And today we are going to be discussing um, part three of our series of um, the Bordeaux theme that's currently on our um, upcoming auction that will be taking place on Sunday and Monday. I think the wine lots will be um, auctioned off on Sunday. Um, so this is the final installment um, in the um, in the in the in the series of uh, of wine, um, and today we're going to just run through the final list of our producers um, with uh, Roland there, Higo, and we're going to be looking at, I suppose, two questions that frame this um, conversation: um, Why um, is Bordeaux the most famous wine in the world, and why then um, are so many South African wines Bordeaux style? Um, so, gentlemen, I think, see we on the on the stroke of four. So, it's um, uh, without any further ado, um, over to uh, Roland Pins and Higo Jacobs. Thanks for joining us today, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you so much, Matthew. Uh, great. We're gonna much like last week and the week before, we're gonna talk through all the lots that uh, will be on auction um, later uh, this week. And um, I think it's a good place to start, just to recap about Bordeaux and. Uh, why Bordeaux is so famous in the world of wine and why South African wines are um, often modeled on Bordeaux and some of the great wines from the 80s and 90s, they were all Bordeaux themed if we think about the Canon Corps, the Mere lists and so on. So Higo will talk more about the South African wines and I'll talk a bit more about the international context. Uh, but what um, sometimes we do forget is that Bordeaux has been making wine for um, almost a thousand years. You can go back to the Roman times, 2000 years where they've been producing wine and um, great chateau like uh, Chateau Oprion, um, Ozone are 500 plus years old. And this, uh, this means Bordeaux has been shaped over a very, very long period of time. Uh, the, the real um, uh, instrumental era for Bordeaux was the 17th, 18th century when they formalized the Bordeaux trade, not only were there f uh, firm links between the Bordeaux uh, wines and the rest of Europe, uh, mainly Belgium, um, Netherlands, and uh, the UK, uh, but um, there, was, there was trade and there was a formality of trade in, in Bordeaux, in fine Bordeaux, so much so that in 1855, they produced a classification, which, um, which was a hierarchy of all the Bordeaux wines on the left bank of Bordeaux. And we know them today as the, as the first and fifth growth, the Grand Cru Classé. And there are other um, classifications in saint emilion in Sauternes, in uh, pissac leonin which are other parts of Bordeaux as well. Uh, funny enough, there's no classification in Pomerol. So a, a fairly lowly Pomerol uh, producer has the same title as Chateau Petrus. Um, that's just one of those anomalies of, of Bordeaux. Um, but because the wines have been trading for so long, over time, uh, we as the, the consumer know roughly what the wines are worth, um, what the price is and where their quality is. So it's been a very long time of selling fine, uh, fine wines. The left bank, um, interestingly, um, is a terroir that changed around the 17th century because it was quite a, a swampy uh, part of Bordeaux um, and the, the Dutch required um, some roads through the, the Medoc in order to get their product closer to the market or quicker to the market. They ended up draining the Medoc uh, in the 17th century and this exposed quite a lot of gravel and gave rise to a lot of the chateaux that are actually famous today. So they weren't uh, producing wine as much wine in Medoc uh, 500 years ago. Um, so it's often the, 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 quite a, a parody that the French talk about terroir, terroir, terroir until the cows come home, but it was effectively the Dutch that made the, the great gravels of Puyac and saint Estep and so on. Um, that's just a, a funny story. Um, but otherwise, the left bank is uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, and that's where it ripens extremely well. Um, often it's picked in October, um, whereas the right bank fa favors more Merlot, and uh, Merlot ripens more in September. So often if you have bad weather in September, then um, October might be better and you might get more, more Cabernet, a more successful Cabernet and thus uh, a left bank vintage. And if you get rain in, in October, the September Merlot might have been picked in excellent conditions and it could be a right bank vintage. Uh, so um, really they're using 
different grapes depending on the on the weather patterns of Bordeaux, and that really means that Bordeaux is a blending um, region. Very rarely do you get 100% Cabernet or 100% Merlot in in Bordeaux. Um, never Petit Verdot really or or Cabernet Franc. Um, but you'll see in our auction we do have some straight Cabernets um, from South Africa because um, on occasion Bordeaux can make uh, um, a straight varietal Cabernet or straight varietal varietal Merlot. Um, depending on on conditions and so on, um, but today we uh, yeah we consider Cabernet Sauvignon a Bordeaux blend, even though it technically is just a blend of of one grape variety. Um, I think that's uh, enough background on on Bordeaux. Uh, we've got some wonderful lots from um, less expensive, better value producers, all the way through up to the the great wines of Bordeaux in Oprion and Petrus and Palma and so on. Um, but um, Higo, why why is Bordeaux so uh, so important in in the South African wine scene and context? Thanks, Roland. Thanks, Matthew, for hosting us, and Strauss for the platform, and thanks everybody for joining. Yeah, we're getting excited now because it's uh, less than a week until our Bordeaux sale. We've already had a very um, successful Rhone online auction earlier this year. But I think um, it must be said that this is a better lineup of wines, you know, obviously depending, this is the wonderful thing about wine as, as similarly with art, um, there's, there's a massive variety according to taste. So uh, if you prefer uh, Burgundy, then, you know, then come to our Burgundy cell if you prefer Rhone. But if, if you like structured, ageable, uh, prestige red wines, this is really a wonderful lineup of uh, 115 lots being uh, auctioned off online. Now you, the bidding is already open online. Um, and then it will be, the hammer will close on Sunday for a live online sale, which is the first, uh, it's a bit of a, a, a first uh, or pioneering for, for us. Um, but it's wonderful to have the opportunity to do that. Uh, Roland, to answer your question, uh, if you look at Bordeaux, it's, it's certainly a competitive space, but Bordeaux remains the most important in terms of the luxury and top-end wine categories around the world. Uh, and they play the spectrum from the top to the bottom. It's a massive quantity. If you look at the, the volume of Bordeaux, it's uh, the same as all of the outputs of South Africa in total, of all the varieties and all the areas. So it's a, it's a big volume, but they, they certainly still lead the way in terms of the top-end. Um, and if you look at the new world competing with them, not the rest of France, but the, the rest of the world and notably the new world, if they compete with them, it would be with the same variety. So it's almost, it's been in the time when everybody was, um, was planting and, and notably so in, in, um, in the Cape in South Africa, it was the, it's the fashionable thing to plant if you want to be, if you identify yourself as a, as a premium producer and you think you have the terroir, then the varieties to plant would have been uh, Bordeaux varieties to, to compete with those and to get the, the high-end prices. But this wasn't historically always the case for South Africa. It's only been very recent, actually. If we look at the history of South African wine, it goes back more than 350 years. The history of Bordeaux varieties in South Africa, except if we, if we exclude semi or which goes all the way back to the start. Um, but the red varieties, really, Cabernet, there's... There's mention made, and I actually had to do a bit of research here because it's not a common narrative. If you ask us about the, the history of Chenin Blanc, for instance, then, or Pinotage, you know, you could talk off the cuff for a long time, but yeah, Cabernet hasn't really been that well documented. Cabernet Franc, Merlot, those varieties, they, they've been noted already as early as the turn of the 19th century, so in the late 1800s, uh, it was planted at Rio Constantia, um, but it wasn't really commercial. Um, in the next sort of notable date to mention is around uh, the 1920s when uh, uh, most of our listeners would know a certain professor, Abraham Perold, uh, from the University of Stellenbosch. He's famous really for uh, uh, creating the hybrid grape variety Pinotage from uh, Sinsa and Pinot Noir. But, you know, he wasn't only, he didn't only do that. He, uh, he, he was a, the leading viticulturist uh, professor at, at the University of Stellenbosch. And in 1920, there's writings of his where he's recommending the planting of Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc and Merlot uh, because of its uh, potential quality, not necessarily for volume or, or uh, 
disease resistance or any of those like would have been the, the narrative uh, earlier. He was talking there specifically about uh, quality and specifically Stellenbosch. And then sort of a few producers started following, but, uh, but Cabernet as a single varietal only started pitching up in the 1950s and only with three producers in the 1950s, Zonnebloom, Alto and Lanzarote. Um, and we have not Zonnebloom with this cell, we've sold Zonnebloom before, but we have Alto and Lanzarote on this cell. Uh, in the 1960s, a, a couple more joined, uh, notably the George Spice, which we have a, a great reverence for, and we really love that wine, the GS66 and the 68. If you find any of those around, um, you can come and sell them on the Strauss platform. They, uh, they're fantastic wines. Um, and then also in the 1970s, then the likes of Mirlist and Rustenburg and Kanonkorp started joining, and that really then gained some momentum for the for the variety of, of Cabernet. Um, and then, as as many of our listeners would know, the Mirlist Rubicon was that moment in uh, 1980 when the Bordeaux blend started taking shape in Stellenbosch, and and soon after, quite a few joined, and from. Um, the, from the 1990s, really, with some international in, investment, uh, we started seeing a lot of Bordeaux blends coming out of specifically uh, Stellenbosch. But yeah, I could go on. I mean, if we if we look at Merlot, it's only really as 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 late as 1982 that the first bottling was at Wivergau. Uh, something like Cabernet Franc is much later. That was first made by um, by Warwick in the 1990s. So it really is a recent history for South Africa, but it's it's at the moment our most um, important red wine category. If you look at Cabernet Sauvignon itself, it's the biggest planting in South Africa. So it's commercially our most important category and probably also from a, a quantity of players in the, in the high end quality spectrum, it's also um, not only from a yeah, um, volume, but also value point of view, our most important category. And we believe, uh, from a curator point of view, we believe we've got all the top producers together in, in this list of 115 lots. We're really excited. Um, and it's a great spread of younger wines and also uh, quite a bit older. Roland, I think last time we got all the way in our discussion to somewhere around M. I think Mouton Rothschild was the, was the last one. Just to recap, maybe just on a few of those extra, those other lots. Um, one theme we didn't talk about hugely in the last two weeks was vintage variation. And uh, I know we spoke about the meal list there, Matthew. If you have a look what the 1995 um, uh, price is compared to, say, the, um, the 1993 and 1994, granted the 95 is a 12-bottle case and a pristine 12-bottle case. It's the first um, full 12-bottle case of Rubicon that I've seen in maybe 10 or, or 15 years. Uh, an incredible investment, um, this, uh, this case of wine. But that was a, regarded as a great vintage for Rubicon, uh, 93 and 94, less so. And if you have a look at the Bordeaux wines that we're, we have on offer, there are also some lesser vintages, um, like 2012, but some great vintages like 2015, 1989, 1998 as well. So I think vintage plays a really big role. And we're starting to see here that the great vintages are are a bit more expensive or a bit more prized on the auction um, because vintage in South Africa hasn't always been uh, promoted uh, fairly. I, I, I still remember that Douglas Green advert that promoted every vintage is a good vintage or every year is a good year. And that's definitely not the case in, in the world of wine. So vintage is very important and we're starting to see some of that um, moving forward. Part of the whole reasoning and inspiration for us to launch this initiative of uh, partnering with Strauss and Co. And, and having the platform to elevate South African wines is really, you know, we, if you look at the world of fine wines, all of the areas around the world, I'm not talking countries, I'm talking specific appellations and markets around the world that have high price points and investable quality or investable grading for their wines are areas that take their vintages seriously. Um, and I think we're to blame ourselves. We, we sort of marketed ourselves as, um, because the sun always shines in the Cape. <laughs> we marketed ourselves as, the, you know, there's, you can almost consistently get nice and fruity wines from the Cape. But if you talk to any quality wine producer um, out of South Africa, they will tell you there's massive vintage variation. 
And it's really great to start seeing that there's now a, a sort of a common narrative around the, the specific top vintages coming out of the Cape and also looking backward, um, the great vintages from the 60s, 70s and the 80s. It's wonderful to have a few of them on our selection here. Uh, what great. maybe okay, I'll start so we, um, start with the list. With the, yeah, maybe I'll start with Mbembe Rots. That's where we left off last time. So that's one of my. I have mentioned it before because it's a it's a little bit of a of a personal um, favorite there. Not not only because it's I think it's a really top producer, but specifically with this lot. Uh, I've been involved before setting up this venture along with Roland and Strauss, uh, along with Wine Cellar and Strauss, uh, been involved for quite a, a, a few years with the Niederberg auction um, and, you know, been attending the, the Cape Winemakers Guild auction for a while and the Cape Wine auction from a charitable point of view. I haven't seen a lot like this from uh, Emar de Compostela. This is straight from the, from the producer. Uh, so it's from Brevard's uh, private cellar. Um, it is just... Uh, I mean, this is this is not something that you even in, if, if you try and go and find the bottles individually, they're super rare because this is from the maiden 2004 vintage, all six vintages building up to the 2009, including the uh, 2008 and 2009. Uh, well, I mean, all of, all six of them are, are, are great wines, but specifically that 2008 I tasted for the Platter Guide in in 2011, so almost 10 years ago. I put it forward for five stars. I think it was unlucky not to get five, but the, it got 96 points in um, in the Wine Advocate, which at the time was unprecedented. I, I think it might still be, Roland, you would know better, but it's uh, it was the highest highest rating for a South African wine on, on the, by Neil Martin on the Wine Advocate platform. And then 2009, I think, I think similar. I think it still might be, to be honest, Hega. I know he's given some 97s uh, in Venice.com, which is his new publication that he tastes for. But 96, um, I think, might be the highest for a red wine. There's sweet and white wines that are 97, 98, and 99. Um, but it, 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 could, it could well be. Um, yeah, I've been lucky enough to do some verticals with Brevere. And uh, it's amazing how these wines do just, um, they seem to age so beautifully. They need about five to eight years to really get to their peak. And then they can plateau. And they, um, they really start to show composure and elegance uh, with time. Um, they really are very, very fine wines, very rare fine wines. Yeah, small production, most of it is exported, so there isn't that much in, in South Africa. Um, and for those who are more interested in varieties, this is Cabernet Franc driven, the blend, so nice and perfumed, but they're not light, they're structured and they can keep for a long time. Um, we should probably not ponder on it too long because we have quite a few lots. Roland, do you yes. want to take the next one? Great, Niederberg. Um, Sure. Uh, the Niederberg wines, I don't think, were made to, uh, to age for 40 years. But uh, every now and again, uh, when we get to taste them, Higo and I get blown out of the water. Um, sure, the, the 74 Niederberg Cabernet is a complete legend, the, the Paul um, Cabernet. Um, the 82 is another legend, and 1980 is not too far from it. Uh, the wines were made in a very sort of serious style back then. There was a fair amount of oak, and um, they had quite a lot of tannin, so they've aged beautifully. Um, not much can be said. I think they're becoming more and more rare at this level. Uh, 10 years ago, I think there's quite a lot in the market, but um, uh, I think we're starting to see them become a lot more rare, especially here, six bottles in really, really good um, condition like this. If you like older wines that are very sort of Bordeaux in style, um, then this is the one for you. It's, um, I think they're gonna be wonderful old, uh, Old ladies, uh, but with enough vigor and power to to be enjoyed with food and over a few hours in the evening. These, these wines are going to change in the glass quite quite uh, dramatically. Yeah, Matthew, if you scroll a little bit up on the picture there, you, you can see the actual alleges of the um, of the bottle. So those are the actual shots of the of the lot. So um, and that's fair. Good... Go for a forty year wine, uh, you can expect Absolutely. that pretty much from any wine around the world. Yeah, they're in the high shoulder. That's that's very good for 40 years. So the wine's condition is good. Obviously, one shouldn't expect uh, vigorous tannins and, uh, uh, you know, primary dark fruits and things like that. It's an old wine, but it's still wonderfully wonderfully fresh. And it's a it's a piece of South African history, I think. Uh, and, and then uh, the next producer, Neil Ellis. Um, 
Yeah, we only have one lot from the Lattice. We've had we've had a few more on sale in, in previous auctions last year as well. This is the CIWG lot. So C, CIWG standing for Cape Independent Winemakers Guild. Um, so it's still going, but it's now just known as the Cape Winemakers Guild, the CWG. Um, this is from the from the 1992 vintage. 92 was uh, already quite a bespoke vintage for Stellenbosch and specifically for Neil Ellis. This is a barrel selection that's then put forward for the for the CWG, uh, tasted by all the members, and then picked for the auction. I think it went on sale in '95. And um, yeah, it's just, I mean, Neil Ellis probably doesn't get the recognition as a quality player because of the widespread commercial success of the producer. I mean, they, they, they make wines, I wouldn't say in the entry level, certainly not an entry level, but they make across the spectrum and quite a bit of wine, but it's still a family owned business. It's still a family concern. It's still very much focused on quality. And the other thing to be noted is, you know, Neil Ellis now is established, but um, he was groundbreaking back in the 1980s to start the non-estate negotiation concept of, um, of sourcing in fruit from all over the place. So he's really put Darling, Hunekloof on the map, um, you know, areas on the, on the West Coast. Sorry, Roland. No, no, I was going to say Algen. He was, he was really the first young gun, wasn't he? And it was actually earlier, it was 73, or seven, late 70s maybe, that he first started being a negotiant. So he was really after he worked at Cliff and Sancho, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he was really a, a go-getter and, and he, he bucked the trend of the KWV system and of the system in South Africa to buy wines, uh, buy grapes from elsewhere and vinify them. So a real original young gun still around, still making great wines with his son. And, um, you know, what, what Neil Ellis can do is make long aging wines, that's for sure. Yeah. So this... That's, is that that's you here? Me. No, that's, <laughs> no, it's not me. The, um, the 92 is now, is now mature, but it's... Uh, it's yeah, kept... you know, can we maybe just meet? There we go. Um, Matthew, is there any way to know where that's coming from? Matthew's muted himself. Apologies. Sorry, everyone, uh, but it's not from us. Um, can everyone still hear me? Roland, can go you hear me? Go. Okay, I yeah, think okay. Um, so, have we said enough about Neil Ellis? Should we move on? Yeah, move on. Sorry about that, everybody. I just uh, re re removed the noisy customer. <laughs> okay, I think we're okay. moving on to Opus One. It's quite an interesting lot and, and a, a good talking point. Um, some of you might um, know the Judgment of Paris in the early 1970s. And that was really the first time when New World wines came up against the great wines of France. And they did very well. In fact, they, um, Chateau Montalina beat um, some of the Burgundies and the Napa Cabernets did very well against the great wines from Bordeaux. And um, it was arguably out of uh, the judgment of Paris that these incredible um, startup wineries or relationships started all around the world. And one of the most famous and oldest is the Opus One project um, formed in 1980 by um, the Rothschild family and Robert Mondavi, who was a very successful producer at the time. And um, they've created Opus One, and over the last 40 years, it's it's one of the great icons of the of the world of wine. And of course, it's a Bordeaux style red. It's Cabernet Sauvignon uh, based, um, and uh, it sells for a huge amount of money in today's uh, market in the current release. Uh, around 10,000 rand a bottle, you'll pay, depending on the exchange rate, of course, of the day. Um, and um, yeah, very very expensive, very high end wine. It, it competes with first growth Bordeaux, and certainly does. In the, in the 1990s, the wines were definitely a little bit more on the elegant, more leaner style, side. Robert Parker's real um, fame um, was was later, late 90s, early 2000s, and many of the wines are much richer and bigger there um, at, at that stage. But um, this is 13 and a half percent alcohol, very classic in style. If you like American wines, this will be probably closer to Bordeaux than it will be to your, your current release American wine, but uh, very, very rare in, in to see this in this market. And yeah, to get this for, I think, 14 to 16,000 Rand, it's going to be under the market price and something really rare and a great, a great wine to have on the table. Um, I wouldn't mind having these two, um, two bottles. There you go. Mm, yeah, it's, and it's in good condition. It's from a, 
from a private seller, but it's um, yeah, the the bottles have been kept, been stored superbly in a nice high high full light still. Uh, I think you have to be a sort of a new world fan to to enjoy them. They they would be quite rich, but they um, they're just some of the most uh, famous wines in the new world uh, being made today. Great. Okay, moving on. We did talk about Chateau Palmer um, in previous uh, weeks because we've got the Alter Ego, which is the second uh, wine of the of Chateau Palmer, the the uh, Margot um, uh, third growth, but really is close to first growth in its quality and in its prestige. And this is the great vintage of 2000 in a Magnum. Um, it's probably just starting to get to its its plateau now. Uh, I see Neil Martin then uh, says in uh, said you know give it five years in 2015. So now 2020, it's 20 years um, uh, down the line, and I think this Magnum will be in in wonderful shape. So um, just a an elegant, mature, powerful Bordeaux. I think this on the Christmas dinner table with maybe some roast chicken. Um, there are very few wines I think that 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 might beat it. Um, very rare, and uh, this wine came direct from Bordeaux cellars. Um, late last year. So um, excellent provenance. You can see the bottle there. It's just um, absolutely perfect. I think Palmer fans will Palmer fans will definitely have a look out for that one. Okay, and then moving on to Placer de Merle. Um, so this is from a wine cellar private client, just a single lot. Uh, the you know the Placer de Merle Caronet is it's it's interesting. It's also a producer with an interesting uh, history. Our, you know, wine fans would know that Placer de Mol belongs to the Destel stable, um, previously SFW and, and then later Destel. This is now, you know, I mean, it's it's been one of the crowns in the Destel, um, one of the jewels in the Destel crown, without a doubt. Uh, unfortunately, well, unfortunately or fortunately at the moment, um, on sale, the property, it's a 1,000 hectare, uh, estate in Franschhoek with incredible uh, terroir. It's just a phenomenal site for making Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. Uh, so I, I don't think it's the, the, it's, the, it's the last we see of Placer de Mol and certainly not of the wines coming from there. Uh, but this might now make it for quite a, become quite a collector's item because the, the future of the brand under, under this shape is certainly uncertain. Um, I've tasted this wine quite recently, I think maybe in 2018 or so. The, the later vintages, interestingly, of Placer de Mol don't necessarily keep that well because they've been made quite ripe, quite plush, um, well-rounded, so they were easy accessible at the early years. But this 99 is, uh, is elegant. It's um, lower alcohol, 13.5% alcohol. You can see it on the label there. And it's just um, in within that elegant frame. It's it's kept really really well. It's mature, but it's uh, it's drinking wonderfully now. I'd say it's like at its peak, um, and it's got a great combination of fruit and this leathery um, sort of earthy nuances to it. So it's a it's a great expression of what what can be done with Cabernet from that site. And as I say, I think we'll we'll see quite a quite a bit of the of the grapes at least from from that. Uh, from those vineyards uh, still being in the in the fray, but um, yeah, I think this will also probably be picked up for a steal because it's not a, you know, it's it's certainly not one of the superstars like some of our other producers, so you might get it at quite a good price. Well, um, what we actually forgot to say is the Niederberg. Most of the Niederberg Cabernet comes from these vineyards, the uh, um, the Paul Cabernet. Um, so it's really on the on the Stellenbosch side of uh, of Paul, rather than on the on the other side of Paul. Yeah. All right. Uh, one of the marquee lots of the auction, Chateau Petrus, uh, 1989. This um, this is, uh, I think, we all know one of the, the great wines of the world. It's a it's an icon uh, Pomerol property that's got famous in the in the 50s um, and 60s, and um, through the Moex family and um, and and the winemaker, and really the. <clears throat> the the 40s uh, vintages of Chateau Petrus were the greatest wines that were produced in Bordeaux at the time. And consistently, this uh, thousand case um, production has just become more and more sought after as, um, as time has gone along. And uh, the 89 was a ripe vintage and regarded as one of the great vintages of Chateau Petrus. Much like the 82, it's also 100 points. 
and uh, the 82 you'd pay about um, 30 percent 40 percent more um, but this is a it's still a very good price especially considering this this estimate was given when the rand was about 25 percent uh, more uh, stronger um, you won't find such a great bottle of 89 petrus for this sort of price and um, we can't obviously uh, allude to who the seller is but what i what we can say is that this has been sellered in one of uh, South Africa's great uh, wine cellars. Uh, it, um, it belongs to one of the owners of one of the, the great properties in South Africa, and they've stored it with all their own stock um, for the last uh, 30 years, really. Um, so we're very happy. The perfect, look at that, that Ullage is perfect. It's a, it's a perfect bottle. And uh, again, this wine is going to last for another 50 years, perhaps, and who knows what it's going to cost then. Um, million rand perhaps who knows it's uh, it's really one of those icon wines of of the world and almost 100 percent molo which uh, which i think a lot of wine geeks would uh, would maybe sort of turn their nose up to but uh, i think uh, pomerol is is not molo it's pomerol yeah it's certainly one of the most famous wines in the world if you uh, and they're just impossible to to buy so it's a it's a Great little opportunity to buy a, a well-stored uh, Petrus in South Africa. And we had that 98 um, last year with the um, the Strauss uh, dinner of, of all the great first growth wines. Higo, that wasn't a bad uh, drop, the 98. <laughs> also yeah, it was probably the star, the star of the show. Yeah, it's so powerful. The, uh, and these wines just remain powerful. It's uh, incredible to see Merlot behave like that, to, um, to have a variety that has a little bit of a reputation to bring the fruit to a Bordeaux blend, to see if it it's on its own with that much concentration and power. Is, uh, yeah, that 98, even though it's 20 years old, was uh, it tasted as if it was just bottled. It uh, had so much uh, tannin and power. Yeah. Okay, Brevet Rat is up again. Yeah, so I've, I've mentioned uh, Brevet before, obviously, with the MR de Compostela, because that's a... a partnership between Brevet and um, Zor um, Membi, um, but this is his, his, his straight uh, family concern. We have two vintages of the family uh, Cabernet Franc. It used to be just known as Cabernet Franc and then changed to Cabernet, uh, family Cabernet Franc. You can, you can see the two um, package or the, the two label differences there, but it's the, it's the same wine. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, Brevet was one of the first uh, to get behind Shannon as a variety, and probably in my mind, the first to completely specialize and get behind Cabernet Franc as a variety. And he, um, he notes the success for the Cabernet Francs as coming from uh, older, older, older vineyard on granite in Stellenbosch. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's just really been the brand to set up a reputation for Cabernet Franc on its own uh, in, in, in bottlings, uh, not to just be a blending component for Bordeaux Reds. Um, the 2005 would now be mature, but the East Cabernet Francs, every vintage, uh, keep really well. 05 was a top, uh, quite concentrated and powerful vintage for Stellenbosch. So this wine has, yeah, it has certainly got the legs for aging. The, the Cab Francs have this wonderful balance between power and finesse. So it has perfume. Uh, quite typically, the, the Cabernet Franc perfume, that sort of leafy spiciness, but then it has all of the structure and concentration. Don't expect light wines. They, uh, they see quite a bit of oak and they, um, they, they have quite a bit of tannin, so they, they're in for the long haul. Uh, yeah, I think that's basically, I mean, what I... If I could just like mention to... um, on the, on the Rats Cabernet Franc, um, one of my favorite uh, memories in, in wine is when Brouvet phoned me, I think in 2007, and he said, yeah, you know, I'd really like to put my wine up against Cheval Blanc, being a, a very highly um, a high blend of, of Cabernet Franc. And I said, well, Brevet, that's, uh, that's, that's quite um, ambitious of you, but let's do it. So we, um, we got a case each of the 2001 through to 2005 uh, um, Cheval Blancs, and we put them in a blind tasting against the 2001 to 2005 Cabernet Francs. And we did it so in Johannesburg and in Cape Town. And it was very much a tie, you, go, you, won't, you won't believe, but... Wow. Um, you know, some of the, the wines were more impressive from the Rats portfolio than the Cheval Blanc. It would be interesting to see that, to, to see that today, um, you know, 10 years down the line. But Brevet does make very, very refined wines that do age phenomenally well. He's, he's had the audacity to, to do that sort of thing from quite early on. 
Um, and I don't know if anyone has the courage to tell him his wines aren't good enough. I certainly, I certainly won't do it to, uh, to his face, Prevost. He's very passionate uh, about these wines, but they have a, an incredible following uh, internationally with fine dining restaurants. He's, he's done really well to pr promote the wines with sommeliers around the world. So they, they, he's got great listings with restaurants, especially in the US and in Europe. So you don't, you don't see a lot of the wine um, floating around, especially older vintages here. So these are two wonderful lots to, to pick up. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, it was sort of early 2000s, early in my wine career, that Jancis Robinson said that Rivere makes the best uh, Cabernet Franc outside Bordeaux. And I think well, that um, really sort of set him going. And, um, and he's been making Cabernet Franc ever since. Very, not the easiest variety to sell, but it is a bit more niche. Um, but if you, if you do like Cabernet Franc, that really fine, that fine almost Pinot Noir-like purity to it, um, you'll love these. Okay, moving on to the Rosan Segla. This is a very interesting property because it was bought uh, in the late 90s by the Chanel Group. Um, and uh, they also bought Chateau Canon. And they've been putting a huge amount of um, energy and, and effort and, and investment into these um, into the chateau. So much so that um, Roson Segler in the last few vintages has become oh, one of the, the most famous wines of Bordeaux. Uh, it's really climbed up the hierarchy, even though it still remains in its 1855 classification. Um, it's starting to get the prices and the prestige and the scores uh, that the top wines of Bordeaux uh, get. So there's a 2000 there, which is. Still early on in the new owner's um, sort of career. Very classic vintage. Roson Segler has got a lot of powerful fruit. It's a Margot property, very generous um, and, and powerful, meaty in style. And then the later vintages have a little bit more polish to them, the 2014. Um, 14 is definitely not a wine to, to drink now. I, I had a 2014 Bordeaux last week and I, I really should have kept it for another five years. It's, uh, they're not quite ready yet, but... Um, that'll be great over the next five to ten years and last for a long time. Whereas the 2000 really is just uh, in super shape now. And I would definitely start drinking my 2000s. Great um, um, quality uh, Margot producer. Mm. Okay, moving on to uh, Rupert and Rothschild. So um, we only have one lot from uh, Rupert and Rothschild. That's the Baron Edmund 2008. So this is a was a collaboration um, between started in the late 90s, um, and it's a collaboration between the the late Dr. Anton Rupert and then um, uh, Baron Edmund uh, Rothschild from Bordeaux. So the Rothschild uh, family of of Bordeaux, I mean, they uh, have great reputation worldwide. They have um, wine interests not only in South Africa but also in in, in the US, uh, but notably. Uh, in Bordeaux and started there. Um, and certainly from a luxury brand point of view, uh, they have a lot of network and, and pool. And then obviously then combining with the Rupert family, they created this, um, this producer on the sort of Paul, uh, Paul Franchuk side of Stellenbosch. And with that immense network and business savvy, they were able to, to set up wines that, probably have had the most success in terms of global market penetration on a combination of quantity and quality that we that we only now seeing one or two other brands achieving but they were they were really um like groundbreaking in in that ability because that's that's quite a, un, a unique uh ability that south africa is only now realizing that we really have to be able to do to penetrate markets it's one thing to have a hundred points uh, rated wine, but then only have one barrel available of it. So that's something that this uh, property really realized quite early on. This wine is named after, after the Baron uh, who founded it, Baron Edmund Rothschild. Uh, this isn't quite the same volume. The, the volume that I'm speaking of is specifically the Classique blend. Uh, that's, that's a lot of wine. The, this is more of a, of a um, barrel and vineyard selection. Um, Which one Cabernet is the EFF favorite, uh, Higo? <laughs> Classic, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, it depends on which one is more, more expensive on the wine list, I suppose. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, these the, the wines are incredible. They were made by Skald Willem um, Hubert, who's now moved on recently, but he's been the winemaker there for two decades long, really crafting quality Bordeaux blends from 
from the estate. They long lived. 2008 is uh, maybe a little bit of a cooler, uh, uh, softer vintage. Um, yeah, I think also probably not a wine that will be too high in price, uh, or hopefully not. But I think it's um, it's a it will be a great wine to get your your wines your your hands on. It might be underrated because of the commercial aspect of the brand, but the the content is uh, is top shelf. Great. Okay, Rustenburg. Uh, well, uh, Peter Barlow for me is uh, the greatest of uh, single vineyard Cabernet in, in, in South Africa. This is a, a vineyard that was planted about 30 years ago now on the fa fairly high slopes of the Simonsburg mountain. Uh, and it's now starting to get some age. But in the late 90s, this is, um, it, it became very famous. It was one of, the, one of the few wines that was rated by Robert Parker. And I think at the time it was um, the highest rated South African red wine uh, was the Peter Barlow. Always made in a very powerful, rich um, style, but yet this wine um, just seems to go on forever. I haven't had the 98 recently, but the 99 um, I had not too long ago. And everyone who tasted it was just blown away by how young this wine um, still was. Uh, it's just a formidable Cabernet Sauvignon, very powerful. I think the later vintages are going to go just as um, just as long, but very rare now to start seeing um, these uh, late 90s vintages. I think the first vintage was 96 um, ago. Before that, it used to go into the Rustenburg Dry Red and um, the Rustenburg Cabernet. Um, just Rustenburg so Cabernet. yeah, this is a real cult wine. Um, if you like something a little bit older than 98, and then the 99, uh, this we tasted with um, the Wine Mag 10 year report last year, and it, it was the top wine. It was the winning wine, the 2009 uh, Peter Barlow. Um, uh, it's just still super young at 10 years. It's really going to go for a very long time. Very powerful, rich, um, great vintage. It's arguably the best vintage for Stellenbosch before 15 and 17. And um, if you like full, full throttle, but yet, um, you know, finely tuned Cabernet, you, you're not going to get much better than this in South Africa. Yeah, also great terroir there, isn't it? The, the sites of Rustenburg in, in the Eidos Valley on the foot uh, of the Simonsburg. I mean, if you, if you want to pick a place to go and plant uh, grapes, I mean, just ask my Lady Maida Lankasang who bought the property right next door and set up Glenelli. This is the place to to grow Cabernet Sauvignon, there's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, okay, um, next up, the Cabernet Collective, I think. Yeah, so this is an, an, an interesting little lot. It's uh, um, the Stellenbosch Cabernet Collective is a members organization and it's they were set up about, around about two years ago really to elevate Stellenbosch Cabernet for, to its rightful place as, um, you know, fine wine category worldwide it's uh i think they probably had a bit of a wake-up call after what the swartland was able to achieve i mean stellenbosch should have been uh, doing that from a marketing point of view much earlier and they um and they've realized that so you know there's nothing wrong with tradition and history and classic and that's uh what they're now just promoting i mean stellenbosch have been making great cabernet and cabernet driven blends for a long time and um they they've approached us to put a lot together they've entered um all wines from from their members and we've picked uh, the 12 best ones this is all from the very highly regarded probably uh probably the vintage of the decade and one of the vintages of the century uh, 2015. yeah if you look at the lineup it's canon corp plane zalze lariche neil ellis oldenburg Rustenfriede. Simonsach, Speer, Star Kandath, Lima, Warwick, and Waterford. It's uh, it's all of them. So this will be a nice little collection. We prefer usually to sell wines from one producer because part of what we're doing with this uh, initiative is to formalize a price point for um, for South African wines. So this is more of a little collector piece and something of interest because you you will. Uh, it's like a box of chocolates, isn't it? You're going to open a different bottle every time from the case. So it's uh, and and from an investment point of view, it'll certainly escalate. And these wines are babies. They, they're going to keep for another 15 years. So, um, yeah, nice lot to pick up. Yeah, I think Stellenbosch is making such a high quality of Cabernet. And uh, really, this is just going to take time for the, the international market to realize that South African Cabernet 
and specifically Stellenbosch Cabernet is one of the great wines of the world. And if you have a look there, if you divide that estimate by 12, you're talking about 600 Rand um, a bottle, um, the low estimate. Um, frankly, that's uh, what, $30? 30, uh, $30? You, you're not going to get a good Cabernet in Napa Valley for 60 to $80. Uh, so this is half to a third of, of, of what you'd pay in, in the Napa Valley. And then, of course, Bordeaux, you know, very much the same. You have to pay a lot more to get the top wine. So, you know, that, that really shows that South African wines are, are underpriced and the quality that you're getting is just phenomenal. Yep. Great. Okay, on to the Stellenreich. This is a this is a quirky old lot. Um, I think um, you you have to know the the Stellenreich wines well. They were they were very classic at the Stein, quite uh, at, the, at the time, quite austere, very Bach Calder in style. So a, a very fair amount of oak, and um, there's there's a following for these wines. Um, they they're quite lean. They've got a lot of uh, tertiary sorts of uh, aromas and. Um, uh, I don't think it will go for a very high price, but whenever these hit the market, they do tend to sell and uh, they're quite collectible. Uh, I think it was a very, very strong brand from SFW in the, in, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and now that it's out of the market, I guess uh, it, it, it's really maybe the older generation that knows these wines um, well. Uh, here you go, you remember them? Yeah, it's, you know, it's... I've been running into Stalinray quite a bit with my work with um, the old Bachkeller Vinatec and uh, you know that's it, it's one of, it's a collector's item if people find them in their cellars now because they were discontinued quite early on the Stalinray wines but they were made the, the the brand was created I think mostly for exports but they were certainly made to be a, a quality um, a quality producer and uh, I don't know I can't remember why it was discontinued but there's there's very good quality Stellenbosch only uh, wines, uh, grapes that went into these wines. So um, yeah, once again, probably not a, a superstar from a brand point of view, so it won't be too expensive, but great wine if you want to taste the, the, uh, the ageable Stellenbosch cabs from the 80s, then Stellenreich is a good place to start. Uh, are we moving on? The next one is uh, Thelema. Wow, I mean, we could probably do a little uh, talk on Thelema on its own. We've got a nice little spread here from uh, from Thelema on sale. Uh, quite an old Cabernet in the 93, and then a younger Cab, and then also the Merlot, which uh, shouldn't be disregarded at all. But just to pause on, uh, to park on Thelema, Giles Webb, you know, we've mentioned, we've, we've complimented uh, Neil Ellis a moment ago in that fashion. I think Giles deserved the same compliment of being a pioneer at his time. You know, if, uh, if we look at uh, the current, currently in the wine industry, everybody's a pioneer <laughs> and um, everyone's um, sort of looking for, for fruits uh, in the most obscure sites, etc. And that's what makes South African wine at the moment very interesting and exciting. But when Giles came along in the, in, uh, the early 1980s, uh, started planting grapes with the help of his wife's family in, in terms of financing it. Um, so planting grapes on, on the top of Felswerte Pass and Simonsburg. Uh, you know, the concept of, of new world wines out of uh, Stellenbosch was still fairly uh, obscure. And um, Giles just uh, started focusing on quality from the vineyard um, and making uh, fruit-driven new world style wines in Stellenbosch from that property. And quite soon, he became a consultant to many other producers to, uh, to be able to do the same. And, uh, you know, interestingly, I, th I can draw quite a parallel between um, uh, the current sort of pioneers or the current shapeshifters and, and Giles Webb. You know, Giles had quite a role to play in the, in the making of, of Ibn Saadi because Giles was involved along um, with Giles Beck with setting up Spice Root. And... Um, consulting there and planting the vineyards and setting it up and of course the first wine winemaker to work at spice root was none other than uh, than ibn saadi so he certainly has some uh, has had some uh, deep uh <laughs> what's that in the in the south african wine industry uh the cabernet sauvignon specifically have tremendous ageability even though they were made uh to be quite uh, fruit forward, they, they have wonderful structure and they age fairly well. Um, 
interesting. He drank that one, Higo, uh, not, not too long ago, the 93. Did I drink it? Yeah, you remember we had it at the, um, at the one uh, Strauss auction. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. We, um, we showed it just before the sale. Yeah. I mean, that's, I remember now that's, it's remarkable how well these wines age. Eh? I mean, they, they just keep their form for, for a long time. Um, and, but still has elegance as well. They had quite a bit of oak in their early years, but they, they've absorbed all of that now and integrated it. So there's, there's, um, no sweet flavors in the wine. They've retained their dryness. Um, just wonderful elegance. Yeah, you can see the alcohol there, 13 and a half. So, yeah, it's uh, the 93 great composure. The, the 2012, I think, is, is an underrated vintage because uh, 2012 probably doesn't stand out, but the more I taste 2012s, they, uh, they outlive quite a few vintages around uh, that era. Uh, they might have been a little bit closed when you were drinking them uh, in early years, but the, the 2012s across Stellenbosch have just uh, kept incredibly well. And interestingly, the Lima, you know, in the 90s, in the 1990s, when the first vintages started coming out, they, they had a superstar uh, reputation. The, the, it was a scrum to, to get the wines. You know, there was a lot of competition to get the wines. And once again, that parallel to be drawn with the Saudi family wines now, that's similar. They sell out on allocation before you can, um, uh, before you can get your hands on them, they, they're on allocation. Uh, Roland's telling me to move on here. Just quickly on the Merlot, don't disregard the Merlot. There's a lot of uh, pedigree also in the Merlot. There aren't that many producers in South Africa that can make Merlot with the kind of quality that uh, the Lima can, the standalone Merlot. They also eat, age very well. This is now mature, uh, won't be expensive, wonderful lot to pick up. Okay, Roland, moving on. We need to unmute you. Sorry, you were gonna talk about Takara, weren't you, um, Higo? Oh, that's true, okay, all right. So I'll, uh, I'll brush over um, Takara a little bit faster there, but that's three very exciting lots. Notably, we've got two whites now, and the, we shouldn't write off the the white Bordeaux, of course, uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon uh, blends. And that's really at least as good as the reds that we make. It just doesn't quite, you know, we, we've been struggling to get a market established for uh, high price points, ageable white wines, um, white Bordeaux at least. Um, but they, these Takara Directors Reserve whites is probably uh, some of the best, if not the best, one of the Bordeaux whites coming out of, uh, of Stellenbosch. Um, and we've got two top vintages here. We've got 2011 and 2014. Both of them uh, received five star. Uh, both of them received 95 points from uh, Tim Atkin in his SA Wine Report. And the notable thing to mention here, it's a combination of around 50-50 Sauvignon and Semillon. But the, you could drink them young, but they really come into their own. Uh, they hit the straps at this five to ten year mark. Um, they develop a little bit of a nutty, oily complexity. Um, so that sort of fruit forward qualities that Sauvignon has in the beginning to be sort of all freshly cut grass and guava and so forth, that remains, but it's secondary and uh, you have all of this nice savory complexity coming out. So the point that I'm making here is don't miss the whites. They are just uh, remarkable. And then the red is 2012. These wines would have still been made by uh, Miles Mossop. Uh, at the time, he's now recently moved on and doing his own thing. But uh, Miles was there from the start. He's made some incredible wines. And this director's reserve is the, is the flagship top. And just one more thing um, to mention about Takara. We've, we've noted quite a bit about um, investment happening in, in the South African wine scene uh, from international investors. We shouldn't disregard the investment coming from local investors. And this is one of the really notable ones and the famous ones. This was GT Ferreira setting up Takara right next door to Thelema on, uh, on the Simonsburg Foots uh, next to, uh, or on the top of Halswurte. Um, and just no holds barred in terms of hospitality, in terms of salary equipment. And they've, these two wines are wonderful, wonderful, ageable Bordeaux uh, blends. Right, okay. Um, Trottenoir, quickly, uh, this is one of my favorite wines of Bordeaux. Very, very hard to find. It's a Moex property, so it's owned by the same owners of Chateau Petrus. 
And uh, yeah, just a, a great Pomerol. 2012 was a very classic vintage um, for Pomerol. It's a, it's a wine you can actually start drinking earlier on. That's the great thing about Merlot. Even though it is, it can be quite powerful in, in, in Pomerol, you can drink it earlier. But this is a wine that's going to last for a very long time. It's hedonistic. It's not far off Le Pain or Petrus, one of the great wines of the Appellation. Um, and uh, relatively affordable, but really one of the icon wines of Bordeaux. So, um, yeah, let's move on from that one, uh, Matthew. Uh, quickly on to the Eiterweg. This is quite a fun lot, uh, but <clears throat> really the point here is Eiterweg, great terroir from um, the southern side of, uh, or the hills of Stellenbosch. And, um, and this wine is from 1974. We've We've tasted a few wines from this collection and we're very, very happy um, with, with the quality. Um, but 74 was the best vintage in, in, in South Africa in the 70s and arguably even um, the best vintage in the, from, from that era, um, 60s and 80s combined. The wines tend to have a much more power and sweetness and richness to them. Um, it was obviously a bit riper in style. And uh, it's amazing how these 74s are just still incredible today. Um, I haven't had the Eiterbeck for some time, but um, very powerful, rich uh, wine. Again, you've got to like the older style wines to, to enjoy these. Yeah, no, they, they're also super hard to come by. Uh, Eight Cake, this is a wonderful little lot. Uh, the Kailune, big this lot. is a, a big lot. Yeah, one bottle, three liter bottle. Um, the thing to mention about the large formats, about the three liters or uh, Magnum and up is that they they age for longer, uh, they, they don't have as much air and exposure, so it's just a larger volume of wine in ratio with air, so they keep for, for longer. This is, uh, I, you know, I haven't seen a three liter of the 82, so it's great to have this on sale. Um, Eight Cake was also in the Distel stables, so perhaps from a marketing point of view, they're right next to Canon Corp, so it's great to have uh, but from a marketing point of view, they might also have looked a little bit commercial, at least uh, lately. But the AK-74 is, um, if I had to single out five South African wines that I've had, the Carlin A-74 uh, is one that, that brought tears to my eyes. And 82 is another top vintage, um, probably the vintage of the decade for the 80s. So yeah, this will be, this will be a great wine to, to park on a large, large party table and, um, and just enjoy some South African history. It's, uh, yeah, and also from the back, Cal has been stored perfectly, so incredible condition and very rare. They just don't make wines like that today, and that's, you don't see this very often. I've seen maybe one yeah. in my, my entire career. Yeah, it's Cabernet Sauvignon with a little bit of uh, Senso with it. Okay, <clears throat> on to Fienvoden, very interesting lot. And in the late 90s, really, this was uh, one of the really up and coming, exciting um, wines in South Africa. Uh, uh, very much, um, almost like the Villafonte of the 90s. Uh, <laughs> hey, here you go. It, um, the wines were, were quite luxurious, quite um, polished, modern. Monsieur Hollande was actually the, uh, the consultant in the late 90s to, um, to this property. And uh, I've ha I had some experiences with Fien Voden in the 90s, which were just incredible. In fact, they were very close to the pinnacle of the entire wine industry at that stage. Unfortunately, there were changes in the family and, um, and uh, it's, it's now a defunct um, producer. But um, the late 90s, this, this was an epoch or an era where Fien Voden was just uh, prolific. And the wines were made in a very Bordeaux style, but in a plush, um, ripe style too. And they've aged remarkably. Um, I've, I've had many older ones and they just have aged um, super well. So um, modern, but very, very well um, sort of made and, and very fine and precision. Um, both the Merlot and the Classique, um, very good wines. Uh, I think towards the mid 2000s, they started losing their real precision and depth. Late 90s, 2001, great wines. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And also becoming increasingly rare, aren't they? they they're hard to, to get your hand on. Uh, I'll move on to okay. Vergelegen. Vergelegen. Yeah, I mean, Vergelegen, uh, every, our, our listeners would know who the, the prestige of Vergelegen in terms of their, their positioning. I mean, there's a reason why it's considered among the top terroir. Their history goes back to the very start of wine in Stellenbosch. 
This was the farm claimed by Willem Arian van Estel, Simon van Estel's son, where he set up his homestead and, uh, and started uh, planting grapes. So it's just basically, it's on the Skarpenberg uh, overlooking Falls Bay in uh, uh, Somerset West. It's it's wonderful, wonderful place to make wine and specifically and notably so quite early identified for planting white and red uh, Bordeaux varieties. And they've put a lot of efforts into the vineyards for making the virus free, etc. Uh, nice little spread here as well. I'll start with the white, the semi or just the bottom right there, Matthew. Um, the the semi or reserve 2013. I mean, the, the whites are at least as good as the reds and they age just as well, if not better in some vintages. This uh, reserve semi or 2013 was a platter five star and I will um, much easily, much more easily put my life on, uh, on hold for the wine being in a good condition, the whites uh, um, than, than the reds. The, the semi or will just keep and, and keep on aging. It, it changes in its makeup. It will come, become more uh, sort of um, maybe lanolin, waxy, oily, and savory, uh, but they, they retain structure, they retain fruit. They, it's just, if you want to see how South African white wine can evolve, buy a semi or from Feichlich, and you won't, be, uh, you won't be wrong there. Then the estate 1998, uh, that was uh, won the award at the International Wine and Spirit Challenge uh, as the best red blend worldwide. Now, I mean, that's um, that's not an easy feat. That's one of the biggest competitions uh, in the world. It happens in London, in the UK. Um, and it's just, uh, I mean, to to get this award uh, of being the best red blend is quite a feat. So this wine... Andre also, also likes that wine, doesn't he? A lot. I think he rates it as one of the greatest wines he's ever made. Yeah, well, it probably is one of the greatest wines he's ever made. It's uh, so Andre Ferencberg has been there for a long time. He's moved moved from Stalinzicht uh, straight down to Feigelegen, and they've also uh, employed a consultancy the likes of Michel Roland, who's famous in Bordeaux. So they have enough uh, ammunition there in terms of vineyard and in terms of uh, personnel. But yeah, this '98 now drinking beautifully. You can see the condition of the bottles there. They they they're brilliant. Uh, the other lot on is the V, the 2005. The V is the flagship vineyard selection, barrel selection, uh, 2005 top vintage. I don't think I have to say that much more about it. I would personally pick the, the 98. Um, this is a little bit bigger, more powerful, more powerful vintage as well. Uh, a little bit more new world, but a top wine nonetheless. Um, yeah, so right. Matthew. Okay, we're almost there, and then we can take some questions. Uh, Villafonte, Matthew. All right, Villafonte, wow. Um, if there's a wine that signifies the South African fine wine revolution, then uh, Villafonte uh, certainly is, uh, is it. Uh, started in 2003 uh, by Mike Radcliffe, uh, Zalma Long, and Phil Fries. Zalma Long and Phil Fries, absolute legends of the um, Californian uh, wine industry, and they've... Uh, um, they've set up an amazing partnership that's, I can't believe, almost 17 years old. I remember going to the launch of this wine, if it was maybe 2006 or late 2005, and uh, everyone was so excited about, um, you know, the investment in, in, in the winelands and this new Bordeaux-esque, or should I say, um, Napa Valley-esque style of, of, of wine in, uh, in, in Pal. And it's gone from strength to strength, you know, consistently one of South Africa's best Bordeaux uh, producing, Bordeaux style producing properties. And what they've done very well, he goes, um, is they've kept quite a lot of stock back as well. So whenever you, there's a launch or a promotion, often you, you get to taste these, yeah. older, the, these older wines and, um, and you just get to see how, how well they have aged. Um, and um, what's also key about these wines is they have, they've really gone up in price quite dramatically. So these back vintages become, um, become quite serious, quite sought after. And uh, yeah, if we start with the oldest one, 2005, um, last tasted, very silky and, and, and complex. Um, it's obviously very much in its, uh, in its mature phase, but it's by no means falling over. It's, um, the M was initially based more on, on Merlot and Malbec, um, but not, not always every vintage. Uh, it still has 31% Cabernet in it. And um, yeah, if you like a really rich, silky, soft wine, that's gonna, that's gonna be it. Um, there's also the 2009 C, which is a little bit more on the, on the Cabernet side, 
very powerful vintage of, of cab. I think we, uh, we know that from the Rustenburg Peter Barlow that we've spoken about. And um, this, this would call rich and powerful. It, it really is a serious wine. Um, by no means is, is this in its plateau. It's probably just starting to, to show you all of its colors, um, but a very, very serious and um, great vintage uh, for, for Villafonte. And then the last is the 2007M, um, a cooler vintage. And um, yeah, this wine, a little bit more uh, expressive, um, quite intense, and yeah, just shows the consistency of, of really what could be the, 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 uh, the pinnacle luxury property of South African fine wine. Um, you know, in excellent marketing, incredible finesse and detail in, in the product, and uh, really just a, a great wine for, for Auckland. Yeah. And then, of course, the Radcliffe family, with Mike having set up uh, Villafonte, the Radcliffe family uh, is behind the Warwick brand. Um, this was Norma and Stan, I think, in the, as early as the 1960s, 1970s, acquiring the property Warwick. And I mean, if we we've given quite a few, quite a bit of, of credit to pioneers and leaders in the in the early industry in Stellenbosch. Uh, one can't mention those names or those words and not think of Norma Ratcliffe uh, in terms of female force in the in the wine industry in South Africa really just driving standards, uh, branding, marketing, quality, establishing this uh, estate as, as one of the top ones in Stellenbosch, not only from wine brand, but also hospitality. And then I think that was taken to another gear uh, with Mike Radcliffe um, uh, starting to take over the marketing and just really sort of understanding the concept of uh, the importance of, of brand and brand positioning. So a nice little spread we have here, mostly the, the two trilogies, 2011, and uh, 2005, so Trilogy is uh, named for the three uh, Bordeaux varieties that they use in the blend, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and, and Cabernet Franc. Uh, the 2011, uh, 94 points from Tim Atkin, four and a half star on the platter. Uh, it's a wine that's quite dry, tannic, quite structured in its youth, so it needed this time. It's nine years old now, but um, drinking incredibly well at the moment. It's really just, and it still has a lot of legs to go. If you want to buy wine to still uh, put away, the trilogy is, is one to go for. And then it's, it's sister, the 2005 vintage is more mature. That would be more in a sort of drinking space and drinking window now. Um, they, as I said, they're quite dry and it's when they released, but this is now softened up, up nicely with the tannin. So that's, that's in its drinking window. Uh, the Cabernet Franc 99, uh, I mean, Warwick, as I mentioned earlier, was the first estate, or the first producer in South Africa to bottle a straight variety of Cabernet Franc. And probably if you corner most uh, wine aficionados in South Africa or worldwide and ask them what's the best wine from Warwick, they'd probably say the Cabernet Franc. Uh, it's usually a little bit higher in price point as well, lower volume release. Um, this 99, I mean, the, the Cabernet Francs age beautifully. They develop this, uh, this earthy, um, leathery sort of um, perfume and that would be one that I probably would personally b uh, bid on as well if it doesn't go too high it's just a wonderful lot six a six bottle lot uh, and then finally the the blue lady as Mike Radcliffe used to call it the big daddy that's uh, no holds barred all Cabernet Sauvignon uh, quite big extraction uh, sort of uh, quite a bit of new oak used um, and it's a single vineyard Bale selection uh, wine, yeah, more a more recent creation from Warwick, uh, but also still very young and lots of ageable or lots of uh, potential for further aging. Um, then I'll just quickly go on to Waterford as well. We've got the Waterford Cabernet Sauvignon 2012, just a single lot from Waterford. Uh, you know, Waterford certainly hasn't set a foot wrong in terms of uh, setting up a luxury brand house. Uh, with what they've done there in terms of brand, the, the experience, the tasting room experience at the farm, uh, the winemaking acumen, um, and it's all really been driven by Kevin Arnold, uh, ex uh, Dalheim and, and Bristol Frieda, and then moved on to set up his own uh, brand in partnership with Jeremy Ord, um, and really just uh, gradually built up this luxury brand of Waterford. And they now have much higher price point wines, notably the Gem, 
uh, this, but the Cabernet Sauvignon I feel is the one to invest in because it's really uh, built up from a low base. I remember at the time when I was doing wine lists for restaurants, this was uh, a no-brainer for me to list as a Cabernet Sauvignon because of its price point. It was just great value, and now gradually it's increased. And I mean, it's still underpriced. It's uh, this 2012 vintage still has lots of legs to go. That's going to be a wonderful little wine to put away in your in your cellar. Roland. Great. Okay, just uh, before we get on to the last um, two lots, just a, a question from David Banford there. Uh, corked wines, impossible for us uh, to take responsibility for that. Uh, we will try our very best to get the wine replaced from the, from the proprietor um, if we can, but often the proprietor doesn't have these wines. So um, it is a risk buying older wines. And David, unfortunately, that's just... Uh, a, a part of wine. Um, I've had many older bottles of, uh, that have been either corked or oxidized, and that's uh, unfortunately just part, part of, the, um, of the risk one takes in, in buying older wines. Anything to add there, Higo? Yeah, no, I think what, you know, we'll do what we can. Uh, we'll certainly, we're not going to have a, a, a strong uh, closed door policy there. We'll engage with each, with each person if somebody has a complaint. We'll approach the producer. It depends, obviously, on who the seller was. Um, but we'll definitely try and make a plan. But there is always the risk with, with cork bottles. Yeah. Okay, and then just the last two Bordeaux wines on the, on the list. We've got Damayak, which is a Mouton Rothschild property from Puyak. If you like classically styled Bordeaux, this is for you. There's a, a lovely set of mature magnums, which will be, um, if they don't go for, for a high amount, those will be just lovely drinks um, over the next couple of, uh, of years. A very classic Puyak style, so Cabernet Sauvignon, um, uh, very silky, earthy, elegant. And then the 2014, which is also a lighter vintage, and that um, you'll get for a very good price, um, maybe under a thousand rand a bottle for, for a really good um, fifth growth uh, Puyak um, from a great uh, producer, Chateau de Mayac, um, very famous and very, very high end uh, Puyak producer. And then lastly, and of course not least, um, Chateau Iken is the most famous of all sweet wines arguably around the world. It's, um, it's a first growth, it's the only first growth of Bordeaux in terms of sweet wines. And this is a wonderful vintage for Ekem 05. It's a vintage that um, is not ready to drink yet. I've, I had it recently last year and it's still showing, um, still quite closed in fact. Um, Ekem really starts to blossom at about 20 years of age, 20, 25 years for a good vintage. And uh, this wine is gonna last for Forever, I've, I've like, had lucky, uh, lucky enough to have some 60, 70 year old Chateau Ikems, which are just marvelous. They, they get a sort of a, a brown, a, um, golden a brown hue, almost green hue. Uh, but these are still very, very young, great vintage. And um, yeah, uh, fabulous, fabulous sweet wine. We don't drink enough sweet wines. And if you're gonna drink a sweet wine, maybe drink the best, and this is it. And um, yeah, if there are any other questions from the from the participants, um, please type them in now, or uh, maybe raise your your hand. But I think you'll see that it's a it's a great lineup of wines from uh, from Bordeaux and from South Africa, and something for every pocket, for every palate. And we've taken you through almost every one. So I wouldn't mind buying that entire list here, Higo. But um, let's see, let's see how budgets are going in these times. Hopefully, yeah. We've now spent uh, three sessions over the course of three weeks to talk about these wines, and we still don't have enough time. We're going over time here now. Um, so they just really deserve so much um, praise and description. There's, uh, we're, I'm really proud of this selection of, of, of lots. Yeah, and let's, let's, as you say, let's see what the market does, but um, it's a wonderful collection of wine. Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, for, for all the bidding um, information, look at uh, the Strauss website, of course, and it is being held live this year. Um, all the information is there. And if you've got any further comments, then Sarah is the person to speak to from Strauss. All of her details are obviously on the website as well. Matthew, you're on mute. There we go. There we go. So thanks, guys. Um, thank you so much, um, gentlemen. That was really fascinating, and I think uh, brought some brought some wonderful closure to the to the the border theme. Um, as you said, I think um, you know, unfortunately we could 
we could really, you know, each one of these, each one of these producers, we could, uh, we could spend a, a far, a far more proportionate time on. Um, it's all, uh, it almost seems, um, seems a pity that, uh, that, that we, that we're here. Just a, a, I suppose a parting shot um, for you guys is if there would be, if there would be sort of two bottles that would be either or from both of you, what, what would be your, what would be, I suppose, a South African lot and an international lot. What would be your choices? Tough question, but uh, just for closure. Yeah, yeah very that tough a um, question. Um, Higa, you want to go first? Yeah, I am. Um, this is literally just personal taste, and I think it's something that will uh, that will be affordable. I hope I don't um, change that fate now if I pick that out as a personal favourite, because I wouldn't mind buying it myself. But the the key first verse. Uh, I think it's 2011 or 2012 that's on sale. It's just a wine that um, that I've been a personal fan of for a long time. It's not easy to come by. Uh, and in terms of that style, Cabernet Franc forward, really perfumed, delicate texture. I, I, I love I love the wine personally. But that would be for drinking, not for, for selling again. Great, yeah. And um, I think the Thelema 93, uh, we were so impressed with it uh, recently. That's a, a terrific bottle of wine. I'd love to sit down with more of those. Mature, so I wouldn't keep it for too long. Um, for, the, for one that really you're going to put down in your cellar and forget about, maybe sell half um, down the line, the Leo Barton 2015. Uh, that's oh, yes. going to be a fabulous wine over time. It's not going to be ridiculously expensive. And uh, with time... I think um, either your kids or your grandkids are going to really enjoy that, bo that, that, that bottle of wine because it's, it needs about another 10, 15, 20 years to really reach its peak. Oh, okay, cool. All right. Fantastic, gentlemen. Um, so, uh, ladies, uh, I just see one more question coming in over here. Um, uh, uh, that's Sarah just saying, um, ladies and gentlemen, please, please go and visit our website should you have any inquiries about bidding. Um, and the bidding is open. And we'll be closing those lots on Sunday. So please, uh, please um, be sure to tune in. And uh, tomorrow we um, we will be joined by Sophie Louise uh, Froelich and uh, Vanessa Phillips in the decorative arts and jewelry department, looking at some um, objects out of the curiosity cabinet in the Strauss and Company's uh, Zoom talkabouts. Today we were joined by Roland Peens and Higo Jacobs, um, our uh, specialists, uh, consulting specialists um, on our fine wine. For um, and they were speaking to us uh, for the final series of our uh, 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 Bordeaux themed sale that will be closing on Sunday. So thank you very much to Roland and Higo. Thank and you. Um, gentlemen, uh, an exciting week. Um, and uh, let's uh, let's hold thumbs and see what happens with the bidding. Thank you very much for for your presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.